Good morning, I'm Mario Barnes. I'm a professor at the University of uh, California Irvine School of Law, and welcome to this morning's plenary on criminal justice reform um, and mass incarceration. And so first of all, I need to um, uh, uh, make a couple of announcements about the constitution of the panel. Uh, James Foreman, who was originally supposed to join us uh, on this panel, um, was not able to because he had a family conflict, but we were um, very fortunate to be able uh, to convince uh, Michael Pernard to join us. Um, and for those of you who were here yesterday, uh, in an older version of the program, Ted Shaw was uh, joining us as well, but as you saw, he gave his insightful um, and provocative comments yesterday. So. <laughs> Uh, um, so, uh, with regard to um, this morning's plenary topic, uh, with 2.3 million Americans behind bars, um, the United States has uh, less than 5% of the world's population, yet it incarcerates nearly a quarter, 22% of the world's prisoners. Um, and as of October 2013, uh, the incarceration rate for the United States was the highest in the world with 700 um, and six, and 716 per 100,000 um, citizens as compared to places like Germany where it's 76 per 100,000, Sweden 60 uh, per 100,000. Um, this of course comes at great societal costs. We spend over $80 billion uh, a year um, to imprison people. Um, as we know, prison um, and mass incarceration is also um, decidedly uh, racialized. Um, in 2014, uh, African Americans who comprise uh, just over 12% of the U.S. population, um, at least um, in the male prison population, constituted 37% um, of the male prison population as composed to, uh, compared to 32 for white males and 22% um, for Hispanic males. Uh, uh, and that's, and it, at least for federal and state facilities, uh, that's an imprisonment rate of 4 to 11 times more than white men and one and a half to three times more than Hispanic men. Black women make up 21 percent um, of the female prison population um, and their imprisonment rate is 1.6 to 4.1 uh, times that of uh, white women across all age groups. Um, and although there are um, uh, claims that things like the war on drug, which itself has racialized um, components uh, to it are responsible for these differences. Uh, we know that blacks are incarcerated for drug offenses at a rate of 10 times greater uh, than that of whites, even though uh, their usage rates are the same. And so, uh, quoting from uh, Michelle Alexander in her excellent 2010 book, the new Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Color and Blindness, she stated, mass incarceration is a stunningly comprehensive and well-disguised system of racialized social control that functions in a manner strikingly similar to Jim Crow. Um, she went on to say that this circumstance um, is not, as many argue, just a symptom of poverty or poor choices, but rather evidence of a new racial caste system at work. So this is the backdrop. Um, uh, against which this panel now considers if uh, or how we might begin to talk about criminal justice reform in and around uh, mass incarceration. And we have put together, I should say, the conveners, I didn't choose them, but I love them all, have put together um, <laughs> uh, an excellent uh, panel for you. And so uh, uh, with the exception of, of Michael, uh, the other plenary panelists, their bios are in the program, so I'm going to briefly introduce them um, and commit you to the, the program to get their more um, extensive bios and following uh, the trend in uh, previous plenaries, each one of them will speak uh, for, for a few minutes. Now, I just have to say, so if the conveners want to be mad, be mad at me. I just couldn't make two work, <laughs> so they'll talk for, for a few minutes, and then uh, we'll have a discussion amongst the panelists, and then um, include a broader discussion. So blame me, not them. But I just—it seems like if you give them two, I'm writing them to note to stop speaking um, as they clear their throat. So I just couldn't um, uh, get that together. But uh, again, I take responsibility and. Uh, I'm an old friend of each of the conveners, and we'll just hope that they'll dip in the friendship bank for me. So um, uh, in introducing our speakers with us, our first speaker will be um, Thena Robinson Mock, who is the project director um, of the Advancements Projects Ending the Schoolhouse to Jailhouse Track Campaign. Um, she's the former executive director of Kids Rethink 
uh, New Orleans School and a, a former staff attorney for the New Orleans Office of the Southern Poverty Law Center, where she provided um, direct representation for youth in juvenile court and in school discipline proceedings. Um, our second speaker will be uh, Michael Pernard, who is um, a professor of law and co-director um, uh, of the clinical law program at the University of Maryland uh, King Carey School of Law. Uh, he currently teaches in the reentry clinic um, and teaches reentry um, re legal theory. Um, he has published several law review articles on the criminal process, criminal defense, uh, lawyering, and interconnections between the reentry um, uh, of individuals uh, with criminal records and collateral consequences uh, of criminal convictions. Uh, our third speaker is Daryl Atkinson. He's a senior staff attorney at the Southern Coalition for Social Justice, where he focuses on drug policy and criminal justice reforms. He was formerly a staff attorney at the North Carolina Office of Indigent Defense Services, where he did significant work developing assessment tools for the collateral consequences of conviction. Um, notably, he is a 2014 White House reentry and employment champion for change, and he is the first um, uh, he is the first in this category, the 2015 United States Department of Justice Second Chance uh, Fellow. He will be followed by Cheryl Harris, who is the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Chair in Civil Rights and Civil Liberties at UCLA School of Law. Uh, she is a founding faculty and current co-director of the UCLA Critical Race Studies Program. Uh, she is, of course, also the, path break, the, art, the author of the path-breaking article, uh, Whiteness as Property, which is germinal within the CRT canon. Um, she began her career, however, working at a leading criminal defense uh, firm in Chicago and as a city attorney in the administration uh, of then-Mayor Harold Washington. Um, and last but certainly not least, uh, we have Devin Carbato, who's the Honorable Harry Pregerson Professor of Law at UCLA, where he formerly served as Vice Dean, and where he has both won the Rudder Teaching Award in the Law School and the University's Distinguished Teaching Award. Um, he is a prolific scholar who's done important work on race in the criminal justice system, and as many of us know, he and Me Too, Galati, um, have written um, exceptional work on race identity performance um, and uh, employment, um, which can be found um, in their 2013 Oxford Press book, Acting White, uh, Rethinking Race in a Post-Racial World. So I am excited uh, about uh, the uh, panel and the discussion we will have, and I will now turn it over uh, to Thena, where it won't be two minutes, but don't get crazy. So. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and is the mic on? Can everyone hear me? I think I hear it. Okay, great. Well, good morning. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here today. Honored to be here and also excited that we have so many people here on a Saturday morning. Um, so that's awesome. Um, so I am, um, as Mario mentioned, project director of Advancement Projects ending the schoolhouse to jailhouse track program in, based in Washington, D.C. Um, and we're a civil rights organization that's been around for about 16 years. Um, and we cover everything from voting to immigrant justice. But what I'm going to talk about today um, is the sort of un unfortunate intersection of education and juvenile justice and what makes up what we know as the school to prison pipeline. Um, so just by way of background, um, I often like to say that I've been advocating around education justice since I was uh, in fourth grade. Um, and at that time, I was learning all about the civil rights movement. Um, I lived in a very small Texas town um, called North Richland Hills um, near Fort Worth, Dallas. It's about an hour from McKinney, Texas. Um, and people might be familiar with McKinney. That's the place where um, the police officer uh, took down the young girl at the pool party. Also not too far from Irving, Texas, where Ahmed Mohammed um, was suspended for the alleged bomb, um, which was actually a science uh, experiment, a clock. Um, and so I was one of the few black girls in my class. Um, and I, when I was learning about the civil rights movement, watching videos of Eyes on the Prize, I actually identified with that struggle. Um, growing up in the 80s. And so I was really upset about our cafeteria food, and I said I was going to do something about it. And so I started a petition to protest the mystery meat in our school. <laughs> and I actually got some signatures, got kind of far, um, but then ended up getting called to the principal's office for causing a disruption um, and was ultimately suspended for starting the petition. And although my mom was not too happy about being called at work, um, she did tell me later that she was proud of me and that maybe I should consider a career in law. <laughs> so here we are today. Here we are today. Um, 
The reality is that a suspension, um, a removal from class, actually has some pretty disastrous consequences. Um, I think I was one of the fortunate ones, but the reality is, is that every year, three million students are suspended out of school or expelled um, or arrested um, for alleged infractions that aren't even um, a crime at all or aren't even really a problem. They're just really a symptom of child and adolescent behavior. And what we have seen with this, the zero tolerance policies that are on the books in many of our schools, um, we have seen what we call not just a school discipline crisis, but actually a racial justice crisis. And what we know is that when students are suspended from school, um, just one suspension in the ninth grade doubles the chance that a, that a child will drop out of school. Um, and what we know is that when children drop out of school, um, they are more likely to be engaged in the juvenile justice system. And it's not by accident that this happens. Um, you know, many of us saw the headlines not too long ago in Columbia, South Carolina, Spring Valley High School, um, where the young girl was dragged out of her chair by a school police officer. And what we know, for many of us working in that field, we had seen those kinds of headlines before. In fact, the first lawsuit I ever filed was in New Orleans, Louisiana, on behalf of a six-year-old who was handcuffed to a desk for throwing a temper tantrum. So many of us have seen the, the, what happens when we have police officers in our school who are poorly trained, who are disciplining kids when they should actually be talking to a counselor instead. Um, but I think... The conversation around Spring Valley really put on blast the role of police in schools and the consequences of having highly policed and punitive environments. So each year, 70% of all school-based arrests involve black or Latino students. So this is an issue in affecting students of color, no doubt. Um, we also know that the zero tolerance policies that are on our books, which mean everything from if you get in a fight, you're out. If you bring something to school that you shouldn't have brought to school, you're out. Um, what we know is that that is a result of really criminal justice policy that's made its way into our schools. Um, so Mario talked about the war on drugs, um, mandatory minimums. When we look at all of the policies of the 80s and of course even well before that, those policies and practices made their way into our classrooms and onto school disciplinary codes. And that makes it possible for a young person to be um, dragged out of school and policed for student behavior. One of the things that happened really in the post-Columbine era is that we started seeing sort of this flood of money coming into schools um, for school resource officers. And I think there's sort of a misperception that, you know, if there's a police officer in school, that's going to, you know, help kids act better, act right, um, follow the rules. But in fact, what happens is it makes the school environment quite negative. And what it means is that rather than protecting young people from an outside threat like a Columbine or a Sandy Hook, what ends up happening is that students are essentially racially profiled in the hallways in class. And the reason why we need to look at this issue very holistically is that often our public schools are incredibly underfunded. And often when teachers are having a challenge with a young person, it becomes quite simple to be like, you know what, just call the officer. I can't deal with this right now. I need to get back to math. When instead, that is a symptom of a school in need of resources, a teacher in need of support. And that support shouldn't be an officer with a gun and handcuffs. One of the challenges that we, that we know is that this school-to-prison pipeline happened so incredibly early. Um, last year, the Department of Education released some data showing that black students represent 18% of pre-K enrollment, but account for 48% of pre-K children receiving out-of-school suspensions. So essentially, we are removing young people from the classroom as early as three and four, year old, four years old. And if anyone has a three or four year old, uh, you know that a temper tantrum or not sitting still or acting out is pretty much part of their job description. Mm -mm. But what has happened is that we have, again, we have criminalized this behavior. Um, there is a professor who I've been following lately, uh, Dr. Phil Goff, who's been doing some incredible research around implicit bias, looking at um, the ways in which we view black children. And there's, a, there's a, a study, some of you may have read it, Essence of Innocence, Consequences of Dehumanizing Black Children. And it found that black children are more likely to be viewed as less innocent 
and four times older than their white peers. So that's how the four-year-old now becomes the 10-year-old, the 11-year-old, the 12-year-old, the, the young person who's, who's deemed a threat. And I think that when we look at who the school to prison pipeline is affecting, um, one thing that I think that's become really crystal clear is that we also need to examine the ways in which these practices affect girls. Um, it wasn't lost on me that the Spring Valley incident involved a black girl. What we know is that around the country, black girls are experiencing push out, experiencing abuse at the hands of police, and, and are being funneled into our juvenile justice system at enormously high rates. And so it's important that when we look at this crisis, we look at it through that intersectional lens. Um, I will just, again, I will, we're going to have questions, so I'm really excited to hear what folks have to say about this. But I think if I could leave you with anything, it's that suspensions, expulsions, and arrests are not the answer to to misconduct, not the answer or the response to child and adolescent behavior. And I think we've got to really examine what is the role, if any, of a police officer inside of a school. Um, should we be thinking about policies and strategies to get them out of our schools, to replace them with supportive, trusted adults who actually know how to work with young children? And when we also look at these disciplinary policies, we need to have the courage to look at them through a racial justice lens, because it's not by accident that these policies are impacting students of color. Thank you. So uh, good morning. I, I, I come to this conference from, from Baltimore. And in Baltimore, uh, we have 55 communities that make up Baltimore City. Uh, 25 of these communities are, are high incarceration communities. These are communities where at least $5 million is spent each year on prison costs alone. And in five of these 25 communities, $10 million is spent on prison costs alone. And there's one community that stands above them all, and that's Sandtown Winchester. That's Freddie Gray's neighborhood. This is where he spent um, his 26 years. And in this neighborhood consists of 20, 72 blocks, 8,500 residents, and $17 million is spent each year um, on prison costs alone in this one community. Uh, but we know that these fiscal costs of incarceration, while, while exorbitant, um, pale in comparison to the human costs that come with, with incarceration. The, the individual who returns to his or her community lost, or the child who was too young to remember the parent who left for prison. So for all reasons imaginable, um, we need to think through and help implement laws and policies and other action steps um, focused on reducing our incarcerated population and moving away from the instinctive use of incarceration. But I want to imagine for a moment that we've reached that place, that we live in a decarcerated United States, whatever decarcerated means. Um, so where are we left? Well, we're left with criminal records. Criminal records will continue to exist in the decarcerated United States, and these records loom large in the lives of approximately 100 million people in the United States, as well as their families and their communities. One in three individuals in the U.S. is arrested by 23 years of age for a juvenile or adult crime that is not a traffic offense. Um, individuals and families throughout the U.S are connected to the criminal justice system, regardless of background, circumstances, similarities, and differences. It's hard to imagine a family that is steered totally clear of the criminal justice system. Someone in the family, a parent, a child, a sibling, a nephew, a niece, an aunt, uncle, cousin, or just close friend, has been arrested. But we know that for blacks and, and Latinos, the connections to the criminal justice system are particularly close, they're intertwined, and they're intimate. 49% of black men are arrested by 23 years of age. 44% of Latino men are arrested by that same age. And so those with criminal records have to live with the collateral consequences that attach to their conviction records, and in many instances, their non-conviction records. And these are the legal penalties that are essentially impossible to quantify, but those who have tried to do so have reached 
at least 43,000. That's the last count that the ABA um, came up with. And so these consequences prevent individuals from, from working in various industries, from, from securing public benefits, from living in public and Section 8 housing, from voting, from having a driver's license, et cetera. And these laws and regulations are all over the place. They're scattered, but they come together to strip away, to penalize, to judge, and to exclude. Right? They make survival a daily ordeal, or more of a daily ordeal. But these individuals also, also have to live with the informal consequences that attach to their criminal records, which are everything else. Um, these are the policies, the practices, the restrictions, the beliefs, the feelings, reactions, and attitudes that exist outside of law, but also isolate, exclude, and stigma, stigmatize. And these are impossible to quantify. So for instance, these are the employers who by practice, habit, or otherwise, simply refuse to hire somebody with a criminal record. The landlords who refuse to rent an apartment to these same individuals. The law enforcement officers who get to know this person just a little bit better. Um, because of the interaction and uses that familiarity to suspect, to surveil, to stop, and to search the parent, the spouse, or the significant other who is forced to shoulder the emotional, financial, physical, and social burdens of their family member's conviction or criminal record, and then the disappointment, the anger, fear, the confusion, and the trauma that this all brings to family members and particularly children. So, as we think about ways and advocate, way, advocate for ways to, to move away from, from mass incarceration, we also have to focus on the ways in which criminal records in and of themselves um, weaken black and Latino men, women, and children, as well as their families and communities. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> it's okay. <laughs> so, you know, when, when Mario asked us to... Uh, submit ideas of what we wanted to talk about. The idea that I came up with was the role of directly impacted people in the fight to abolish mass criminalization. And there are two words that I really want to emphasize in that title, abolition and mass criminalization. So I'll begin with a critique, right, of the, even the title of this panel. And I think my personal trajectory Will, will help ground us in that particular perspective. Uh, in 1996, I pled guilty to a first-time nonviolent drug crime. I spent 40 months in prison in the Alabama Department of Corrections on a 10-year sentence. I went into prison with a high school diploma. I came out with a high school diploma. The state of Alabama was nearly as progressive as many other states in offering post-secondary educa post educational opportunities. You couldn't even take correspondence courses if you were willing to pay for them. Fortunate enough for me, I had a loving family who came and picked me up from that maximum security institution that I was released from, where 60% of the population had life without parole. And I had them wrap around me and offer me support, both emotional, financial. I didn't have those immediate Maslonian pressures pressing down upon me. I didn't have to worry about where I was going to live. I didn't have to worry about what I was going to eat. And as a result, I could develop a plan and piece my life back together. And, you know, uh, Mario read some of the bio, and I've been able to achieve a certain modicum of success. But I don't tell that story to highlight any exceptional attributes that I have. I consider myself pretty average. I am left a 1,000 brilliant men behind the wall. And the only thing that separates me from them is what do they return to? What kind of support system? So how do we do that? when not every family is going to be like mine, when not every community is going to have the level of privilege that mine had. So we do that by creating secondary support systems with our policies and practices to create environments where people can be successful, right? And when I look at my personal trajectory, the 40 months in prison was a blip on the radar screen of life. It was really the criminalization and what came with that, and I tend not to call them collateral consequences anymore because it ain't shit collateral about them. <laughs> They're very direct. When you can't live in public housing, that's really direct. When your TANF benefits are eradicated because you've been convicted of a drug crime, that's really direct. It's legal fiction, right, mm -hmm. and a convenience that we have come up with to think that these penalties are not sh or should not be 
factored into the punishment calculus. So what I'm trying to abolish, not reform, because when I look at my sheroes and heroes, Harriet Tubman wasn't trying to reform slavery. She was trying to end it, right? So what I'm trying to abolish is mass criminalization and the punishment paradigm as a whole, to think about for us as a society to think differently about how we can deal with harm in our communities. And in many ways, many of these communities are already doing it. 15% of crime goes reported. That means 85% doesn't. So these communities are determining ways to deal with harm that happens. And they're coming up with their own solutions. And I think about my grandparents in Tuskegee, Alabama, where I was born, where if I move back to today, I still can't vote, even though I'm barred in two different states because I was convicted of a crime that the state of Alabama designates as a crime of moral turpitude. But when I think about my grandmother and grandfather, one, she was an Eastern star, he was a Mason, they were pillars in their community. They graduated from the institute before it was even called the university. And when I think about them, harm happened in their communities all the time. Bad things would happen. Somebody might drink too much and hit a loved one. Somebody might steal another one's farm animal or farm tools or what have you. But they weren't calling the Bull Connor of Tuskegee, Alabama, to come adjudicate those issues in their community because they knew he was bringing more harm than good. We're very much at that same place in our communities, and I think we need to think of innovative solutions to where we can respond to harm in a much different way and shrink the punishment paradigm as a whole. Really radically decriminalize and, and find other ways to deal with problems that we might, or behaviors that we might deem problematic in our particular society. So I think the provocative question that I want to leave with you all is how do you use your educational privilege, the privilege that you have at these prestigious universities, the privilege that you have in being able to, to advocate on behalf of people? How do you use that to make space for directly impacted folks to become a part of a mass movement to end this, what we're doing in this country? Because unfortunately, we are not going to litigate our way out of this problem. There's not one legal theory that's going to bring this system to a screeching halt. We're not going to law review our way out of this problem <laughs> until, until the people most impacted, the 70 million people with records, until they're on the front lines of this fight demanding something different, we will continue to replicate what we've been doing in this country in different forms of fashion for the next 40 or 50 years. So how can you do that with your scholarship, with the, with the legal tools and the legal privileges that you have for impacted communities? And I hope we can springboard off that in some of our Q&A. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased to follow on Daryl's comments because um, partly what I want to think about is kind of a cautionary tale about the models that we have of criminal justice reform. And what he's just laid out is an argument for abolition. And what I want to just look at is the fact of, of sort of situating where we are. So it's clear that we're at an important and crucial uh, political moment. Um, and it's not because the deaths of black people at the hands of the police or even what we now call mass incarceration is a new phenomenon. This is actually part of uh, the history of black people in the United States. Certainly the history of other people of color have also had very troubled relationships with the state and the state apparatus. Um, but what I really want to focus on is actually picking up on something um, that Judge Keith and uh, both uh, Kim Crenshaw said last night. And so uh, Judge Keith said, um, you know, when you're in pain, you have to complain. Uh, and if you don't complain, they will kill you and think it's all right. Um, so we are in a moment where the, this recognition and uh, the recognition of a crisis has produced reform efforts. And uh, what I'm hoping to really interrogate is what are the models that we have of reform. And my worry relates to the ways in which some of the reform efforts may or have insufficiently contest or at times even reaffirm a, a kind of trope about black cultural dysfunction. So um, Kim argued last night that we're in an era of Moynihan 2.0. Um, 
and in which uh, the issue of uh, inequality and racial inequality, um, is, as you recall from Moynihan, was deemed to be the consequence of the breakdown of the black family, and specifically the deviance of black family formations um, because of the ascendancy of the black matriarch. Uh, I don't know if any of you saw it, but ta Coates wrote a piece uh, called The Black Family in the Age of Mass Incarceration, where he basically looks at um, Moynihan again and points out, uh, as he argues, a set of links between the notions of black familial uh, pathology uh, and mass incarceration. Um, he actually comes to an interesting conclusion, which I'm hoping maybe we can talk a little bit about. I don't want to take up too much time here. But he says we actually need to recover the intent that he had, that Moynihan had, not the sort of formation. I, I'm not so sure about that. But, but anyway. Um, so what we have now, though, is, and what I think Kim was trying to lay out last night, is the ways in which this Moynihan 2.0 has actually become not just promulgated by conservatives, but by well-meaning allies as well as blacks and others who think that this might be the model for intervention. So we have various policy initiatives that continue to lapse into notions of cultural dysfunction or deficit, particularly as it relates to the presumed absence of stable black father figures. Uh, so you have MBK, uh, um, My Brother's Keeper, which Kim uh, talked about last night. But I actually also want to um, raise a question about what is the model, the research model that we are sort of uh, embedded in as we go forward. So one way of critiquing uh, some of the models is to say they've left black women and black girls out. Right, which that's clearly the case. But the question is, what are the research models that we are even um, mobilizing to take a look at the data? And that's what I, I, I want to talk about. So in some ways, even when there is a discussion now about the crisis of incarceration or the crisis of um, the deaths of, 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 of black people at the hands of the police, there's often a uh, focus on black communities as somehow deficit, deficient, pathological. Um, and so you have this focus on black families um, is still really driven by heteronormative uh, premises. So there's an inadequacy of black female parenting. Um, and so we need to not only think about the research on forgotten or overlooked populations, but the research methods. So the first step in a lot of these research models is to measure the racial difference. And, and one of the things I'm drawing now on uh, the work of Angela James, who's a demographer, who's been thinking about the ways in which we actually measure this stuff. Uh, is that and what she says is that routine research methods tend to treat race as a reflective of a fixed difference between populations. So we treat race as this variable that's fixed, and then we look at it across populations. The problem, as she points out, is that this presents race as an inherent characteristic that's the causal explanation for the observed difference. So um, we treat race as a fixed thing. Uh, this tends to basically reinscribe notions of race as sort of innate, um, and the collection of data and interpretation of data concerning race is oftentimes then distorted and conscripted into dystopic racial narratives. So what do I mean by that? Well, consider research on the black families and the ways in which uh, there's often discussion about racial differences in marriage rates, racial differences in two-parent households, et cetera. So the first problem is, is that this ignores actual black families. Right. I mean, what I mean by that is it privileges the male-female dyad. Um, it presumes that black families ought to or, at least, or, or are being measured against a norm in which is basically a heteronormative norm uh, of single-parent families and ignores diasporic families. And what I mean by that is family structures that in which there are big, uh, strong, effective ties, but not everybody's all in the same household, and maybe not all, but everybody's all in the same country, right? Um, it ignores gay and lesbian families, and it ignores families that are defined by affiliational ties and effective ties. So, you know, I was thinking about Athena's uh, story. You know, many of us grew up uh, in households where um, the, the effective ties were just as strong as the kinship ties, meaning there was somebody down the block that we called aunt, right, who wasn't really an aunt, but who had as much authority over us as an aunt. Um, and so this is to say that a particular family, um, when we look at the research methods, may focus in on, say, how many single-family uh, 
uh, female-headed households are there, this may overlook the relationships that the mother has to other parental figures, to female partners, or to other adults who may be part of these kinship ne networks. So the focus then on the relative health or disease of the black family is often constructed against these white, heterosexual, middle-class norms. So instead of investigating the actual lived experience of black families in all of their complexities, as well as the hostile conditions under which they have to function, the research models tend to be still wedded to white normativity. The second, and the last point is this. Um, how is the data interpreted? And how are black family formations considered to be significantly different? Well, we know that policy debates continue to frame black family life as deficient based on low marriage rates and the prevalence of single parent families. But as it turns out, it's really widely recognized among demographers that as a general matter, at least with reference to heterosexual marriage, people marry later, are more likely to cohabit, have children outside of marriage, and divorce at higher rates. So marriage is less common, period. And yet, black family patterns, marriage patterns, still get called distinct or deviant, even against a norm which has uh, shifted. Right? Um, and so to this extent, this distorted picture of African Americans in marriage really reflects a lot of long-held beliefs and representations regarding the social importance of marriage as an institution which protects normality against racially degraded or socially deviant others. So even as we have this moment where marriage equality is sort of put on the table as a reform effort that somehow signals a more capacious understanding of marriage, we have this rhetoric around marriage and black families that continues to sort of reproduce a notion of them as deviant when in fact the norm has moved. The, the final point is, and I know I said that already, but mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the consequence of inequality is treated as the cause. Let me just say that again. The consequence of inequality is treated as the cause. So what uh, James points out is that we, we take a, let's take a look at this notion of the data on low marriage rates. Um, so a lot of the studies say, well, this is really related to the lower availability of black male marriage partners, and that that, in turn, drives economic inequality. However, the question really is, are these racial differences causing the economic inequality, or are those differences an effect of the inequality? And the economic marginalization of black men, and for that matter, black women, that has been produced by mass incarceration and some of the other uh, factors that uh, have already been discussed, is really um, impacting family formation, but the measured racial difference is not causing the economic marginality. It's a consequence of the economic marginalization. And so the point I'm trying to get at here is as we move into a discussion about you know, getting research, getting better data, driving better public policy, that we have to be cautious about the models in which we're embedded. And I'm looking forward to further discussion. <laughs> Uh, so what I thought I might uh, do in the limited time that I have, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, show a PowerPoint, uh, so I don't need to do that. What I thought I might do in the limited time that I have is um, describe a very, very one more time, very uh, provisional model of thinking about race and police violence. My sense is that if we begin to think about race and police violence as a structural problem, it has entailments for the kinds of intervention we might want to perform. So there are five basic dimensions of this model that I'm hoping you'll help me think through. The first is repeated police interactions. Repeated police interactions plays a significant role uh, setting the stage for police violence. Underwriting my view in this respect is that there is a relationship between ordinary police interactions like traffic stops and extraordinary police violence like gun shooting. So we need to think about the moment of contact as creating a condition of possibility for the moment of violence. And there are a number of variables that facilitate uh, ongoing police contact that African Americans have with the police. Each of them are themselves structures that we ought to be thinking about. One is the criminality uh, presumption that attaches uh, to African Americans. I don't think I need to say much more about that. Another is background racial segregation. And there are at least two significant ways in which background racial segregation plays a role. One, it concentrates African Americans in economically depressed area where there's always already a perceived need for aggressive law enforcement presence. So think about the war on drugs or the war on crime. The ideologies that underwrite both of those ideas have distributional effects, which is the most 
mobilization of police officers in African American communities, which of course facilitates contact. Think as well about mass criminalization. We've talked a lot about mass um, uh, incarceration, but mass criminalization is its precursors. And there are a number of ways to think about that. It includes, for example, the diffusion of criminal justice norms, actors, ethics, logics into the welfare state. The school to prison pipeline is one quintessential example. We might think as well about the criminalization of relatively non-serious activities. And the reason this is particularly serious for our purposes is that it means that when police officers leave the station house, they already have probable cause against the backdrop of everything that is criminalized. So police officers don't need any uh, justifications to stop people because they already have it. Think as well about revenue generating policing. We've learned quite a bit about that with respect to Ferguson, but it, by, it is by no means the only domain within which that is happening. Misdemeanor warrants. So we might think of these as failure to show up or failure to pay warrants. You get a ticket, you don't pay, you don't show up, you get a warrant. In Ferguson, for example, there were 32,000 of these warrants that were issued in a population of 21,000. It means that many people in Ferguson have warrants for their arrest. This clearly facilitates police contact. And Fourth Amendment law, this does an awful lot of work facilitating police contact with the police. And I, you know, every time I mention Fourth Amendment law, I have to be careful because it's a big hole, and if I go in it, I won't be able to come back. <laughs> so you'll have to say, come back, Devin, come back. <laughs> so, um... <laughs> I, 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 thank you. My <laughs> I just want to say that the Fourth Amendment law is supposed to protect us from the police, but in fact it protects the police from us in the sense of not engendering the kind of scrutiny we, we might want. So all of this is to say that repeated police interactions is one significant dynamic that puts uh, African Americans on the pathway to police violence. Another is police culture and training. I don't think I need to say more about that. The third and fourth dynamic seeks to answer something like the following question. So what happens when police violence interacts with the legal system? What is the outcome? And there are two dynamics that we need to think about here. One is the justifiable force dynamic, which is to say that police violence plus the legal system gets translated into justifiable force. And think about that in the context of the criminal process. There are a number of ways in which that happens. A prosecutor, for example, might decide not to bring charges. Do you know that case? I mean, that's a moment in which legal, I'm sorry, police violence is being translated into justifiable force. Or the grand jury might decide not to indict. Or assuming there's an indictment, the jury or the judge decides that the officer's conduct is reasonable. Each of these are moments in which violence is translated into justifiable force. Think now about the civil process and specifically about qualified immunity and indemnification. Qualified immunity, the problem, to quote Donald Trump, is huge. It's a very big problem. Um, the doctrine uh, works in something like the following way. So, come back, Devin. Come back. <laughs> Uh, so, so, so we don't pay enough attention to this doctrine. It's a really important doctrine. So there are two dimensions of the doctrine, one dimension. So you have to establish that there's a violation of a constitutional right. But that's not enough, because the Supreme Court will then ask, was the constitutional right clearly established at the moment that the officer acted? And all too often, the Supreme Court answers that question in the negative. No, the right was not clearly established, which means the officer is not held accountable. Assume now that the officer is held accountable. The officer is then indemnified by the city. So why am I talking about this justifiable force dynamic and this qualified immunity and indemnification dynamic? Because it creates a non, um, it creates a disincentive for police officers to exercise care. If an officer knows at the front end that at the back end a legal actor is going to say justifiable force, qualified immunity, or indemnification, that officer is not going to think long and hard about when or how to mobilize uh, force, which takes us right back to the violence problem. What I'm trying to suggest, then, is that we ought to be thinking about police violence in this structural way. It has enormous entailments for our interventions. We need to be thinking about segregation. We need to be thinking about law. We need to think about police officer training. It's not simply about um, diversifying police forces, which is what's been thrown out as the solution. I want to suggest that the problem is bigger than that. Thank you. So, uh, thank you for these uh, riveting presentations. And I guess I, I want to pick up with a question that um, speaks. Oh, I'm sorry. I want to pick up on a theme that speaks across your um, 
presentations and that what what should reform look like, right? So we have, um, well, and, 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 or not look like. We, so we have last month uh, Michael Maurer from the Sentencing Project testifying in Congress that we need fair sentencing um, and lower sentences for no, most nonviolent crimes. We've got the Brennan Center in New York um, is pushing legislation uh, which would basically incentivize states to reduce their prison population through decriminalization and other things. We have, um, you know, legalization uh, which, in theory, should has the potential to have some effect uh, on the war on drugs if it, it's followed by um, decriminalization and lower sentences. And so, does and, and even recently, the UN came out and look, basically said part of the American prison pop, um, problem is uh, starts in schools and this um, schools to prison pipeline and the way in which we um, pathologize uh, conduct as criminal uh, in schools. And so. Do any of these kind of legislative or at least societal um, uh, frames that push toward decarceration, decriminalization, have hope for reform? Or are there just um, uh, these things are unlikely to help where we find ourselves now? Don't all jump in at once. I'll take a step. It depends. Okay. And it <laughs> <laughs> like Spoken like a true lawyer. <laughs> and it depends if it's working in service of something larger. So when I think about these issues and put them in a historical context, mass criminalization, the second class status of people with records, really are just symptoms of a deeper American sickness that we've been grappling with for 400 years. Structural racism that works in service of white supremacy, patriarchy, and malignant capitalism. This is just the remixed flavor of old, old problems, right? And so if reform or incrementalism is working in service of broader abolition and really broader, deep reparations and reconstruction, right? I'm trying to usher in the third reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And I mean, when we think about these different periods and times, you know, Waquak's work, Michelle's work, Angela Davis's work, they've really cataloged that every 50 years or so, the system kind of morphs and, and remixes itself and changes, right? And so we had, you know, the, the so-called abolition of slavery, but you all know, you all read the text, it's a huge exception clause in there. You know, we really didn't abolish anything, we just changed it where slavery is perfectly fine for people who've been convicted of crimes. We had the abolition of slavery, and then we had some reconstruction amendments, but we never really aggressively embraced 40 acres and a mule. We had Jim Crow, and then we, we passed some seminal civil rights amendments, but we never really addressed remedial harm in the form of aggressive affirmative action. At best, we can say we aggressively pursued it for 20 or 30 years, and I think that's a, a generous take on history. And here we are now with mass criminalization. This is America's chance once again to get it right, to finally do deep, long-term reinvestment in the communities that we've been waging war with. So we act like we don't have alternatives to the punishment paradigm. Yes, we do. Look at how we deal with uh, highly advantaged affluent communities. That's the alternative. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the socioeconomic indicators of health and wellness for those communities and the public safety outcomes that it produces, you see good transportation. You see access to jobs. You see healthy food. You see uh, uh, not environmental toxins in their communities. And they produce a certain set of public safety outcomes. We have to now use our legal skills to create the political will to where we create that kind of policy regime where less advantaged communities can have access to those same things, and then you will see the same public safety outcomes, right? It isn't that we're pathological, mm -hmm. that these are bad people. They just don't have the same supports and networks and structures set up to produce a set of public safety outcomes. So I say it depends. If it's working in service of something larger, it could be. And here's, a, and here's a quick way to sort of think about why it depends. So there's an awful lot of discussions about, for example, decriminalization, which makes perfect sense. What's obscured in the decriminalization move is that police officers are still the actors behind um, 
you know, civil offenses. And so that's a profound problem. So you might have something that's ratcheted down so that it might not even be a crime, but the officer is still enforcing it, which then leads right back to criminalization at the back end. So even the discourse of criminalization can end up legitimizing the reproduction of the very thing we want to contest. So I, under, I completely agree with the idea that um, it really does depend. And I would just weigh in uh, quickly on schools. I mean, so the movement to end zero tolerance and highly police schools really started sort of with this short-term strategy of, all right, we just need to limit the role of police in schools. We need to come up with a memorandum of understanding so that police understand their role. They know when and when to discipline, when not to. Um, but what we realize is that we need to push for something a little bit more transformative because this isn't about making police nicer. This isn't about, you know, um, trying to reform that. I mean, we need to examine why should they be there in the first place. Um, we have a, millions of dollars that come through to school districts every year um, to fund police and schools. So this has now become sort of an incentivized funding stream um, inside of our schools. We need to cut that off. Um, and to do that, it, it might mean a short-term strategy of reforming practices, but it's got to be aimed at that long-term goal of, of not having them inside of the classroom. I just want to follow up on, on, on Devin's point about, about the civil offenses. And... Um, we still have access to records that have civil offenses on them, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, for instance, Maryland, um, you can look up anyone's court record in Maryland, anyone's criminal record, and civil offenses are it's hard. To, not everyone knows what a civil offense is versus a criminal offense. So you still have this access. It will still deny people employment. It will still deny folks um, um, housing. So it's important that we really recognize that sometimes things that we think are really different are actually are a bit more are, are a bit more shaded. And for the folks who are actually in the system, right, so we could talk about ways to, quote, unquote, fix all these other aspects of the system. But now, what do we do for these folks who are burdened, you know, by, by, by these records? And I think, so I think a part of all this, yesterday we talked a lot about dignity. I think we also have to focus on notions of redemption. That is, how do we allow, how do we, what avenues can we create to allow people to truly move past the circumstances that, 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 that weigh them down? So one of the uh, conversation streams yesterday was the way in, in which we are in a unique moment for social movements in and around racial injustice, um, particularly around police violence. Um, Black Lives Matter, um, say her name. Is there some hope um, that social movements uh, will help get us to social change? I don't think we've ever gotten to social change without them. So mm -hmm. I, I would say that we ha absolutely have to um, look to these and nurture them and um, think about the ways in which uh, they are going to be an essential part of the transformative vision that I think uh, we're sort of putting on the table. I, I hate to, you know, sort of add, do the butt part, um, but I, I, I am troubled by the way in which we are now also in another moment which I fear is going to be overdetermined by, uh, once again, the war on terror. Mm -hmm. um, and so... You know, even as we are sort of at this moment where we can see both student movements, um, movements in the street, protests, demanding a kind of accountability, um, you know, the events in Paris are uh, uh, very much mobilizing. I mean, the, the rhetoric around this is absolutely stunning. Uh, and the fact that nobody, I, I should say in terms of the, the mainstream media and sort of political actors, are calling this out. Um, so one of the cases that um, I, I was recently struck by, um, and, and some of you may be familiar with it, this is the case in New York, uh, Hassan versus New York, which was brought um, against the mapping project of the New York Police Department that was basically mapping all the Muslims uh, in New York and in New Jersey. Um, there was a lawsuit brought, um, and initially it was dismissed on summary judgment by the district court. Uh, on standing grounds, and also because the court said the plaintiff didn't state a claim uh, because he didn't allege that the city had adopted and implemented the surveillance program for um, not for a neutral investigative reason, but on the basis of race. So, in other words, they said you didn't really you didn't really show that this was on the basis of race and not a neutral um, investigative reason. 
if that isn't Korematsu, I don't know what is. I mean, that, that's basically the same logic that said we didn't, we didn't intern the Japanese Americans because of their race. We interned them because of national security interests. So I'm saying that now that uh, summary judgment um, decision was overturned uh, on appeal and the, and the case has been reinstated. But even the fact that that logic can be uh, you know, espoused is, is something that I see as something that we are going to ha actually have to take on board if the social movements that have already started are going to have any traction. In other words, we're going to have to take on board this sort of notion of the national security apparatus as being a legitimate exception to um, uh, um, sort of constitutional constraints or even reform efforts, because I see these as being um, situations that are potentially going in, in, in opposite directions, that as we move towards greater transparency for the police, as we move towards uh, body camps, uh, as we move towards all of these other kinds of reform efforts, we have another train running, right? Uh, which is uh, I I extraordinarily troublesome. Uh, <clears throat> one thing, though, in addition, I think we need to think about what is going to be the new economy. Uh, you know, it was a seminal book written by uh, experts in the field, Mass Incarceration, Causes and Consequences, brought together the best scholars from around the country to, you know, kind of riff on this problem. And one of the key facts that I took from the piece was that less formally educated men are highly likely to end up in the criminal justice system if they were born after that, you know, in, uh, after 1970. And prior to our incarceration spike, we didn't always treat less formally educated people that way because we had economy mm -hmm. to absorb them, right? We had textile, we had automotive, we had uh, in construction, industrial-based economy to absorb that group of folks. And some of Be Becky Pettit's work, Invisible Men, you know, part of her thesis is that part of the carceral state, of the ramp up of the carceral state, is to absorb and hide the economic inequality that we really have because those folks aren't included in unemployment stats, they aren't included in labor data. So when we think about shrinking the system, that's gonna put some folks out of work. We're gonna need less police, less DAs, less public defenders, less judges, less corrections. Where are those folks gonna go work? And they're gonna fight us tooth and nail until we can paint an alternative of where they are gonna work, right? In addition to Michael's point, now where are the people who've been harmed by the system, who are coming out of criminalization, who are coming out of incarceration, where are they going to work as well? Mm -hmm. So we need to be thinking about economic and community and different economic models that can provide an opportunity for people to be able to make a legal living and to absorb both groups into a new economy if we're really thinking about shrinking the carceral state. Mm -hmm. I guess a, a, you, you raise a, a, a point of uh, economics and finances that there's a question on the flip side too, right? When we get the sort of um, recent, most recent spike um, in uh, prison population after um, Reagan's anti-drug act mm -hmm. uh, then leads to the boom in private funding mm -hmm. um, of the building of prisons, right? So the money was in the incarceration because that's where um, you know, we got funding to build them and to private companies for maintaining them. And so if, if we actually um, are moving toward real reform, decarceration, what happens to the, not only the economic model you propose, which is the, the, the notion of what happens to these, to these individuals, mostly men, once they're no longer in prison, what, what happens to prisons, um, you know, the, the prison industrial complex? Um, if, in, in other words, people will, you know, at, at least in the hood and on the streets, is like, nobody's not, you know, abolition, nobody's getting rid of prison, that's where the money is, right? And so, um, is that right? Is we, there's no real um, ability to move beyond this because the finances don't work in either way, and that the, these folks who would rejoin the economy become problematic, but the economy of, around incarcerating them uh, won't support um, mass release. Well. I guess I would say that what we're really talking about is the neoliberal economic model, which has to do with um, 
basically transferring the public fisc into private hands. I mean, what, you, what you're really describing is the privatization of prisons was the leading edge. And now I would argue, you know, apropos of what Thena's talking about, is the next big pot of money that is being uh, hollowed out and put into private hands is education. That's the, that's the next big pot of money. So all, all of, and that's through the form of charters, schools, and the like. I mean, it's basically about the transfer of the, of the control over the public fisc into private hands. Um, what I would say is that uh, what it really calls on is um, a, a really radical rethinking of the entire economic model. Right, um, and that's why it, it is a challenge to think about uh, that as a goal. But I don't think that we can get to any substantive um, interventions here without taking that on board. So one of the questions I think that you know when we are sort of looking at uh, this issue is how have the policies of the last 20 to 30 years sort of um, set up an economic model in which there are, um, because in some ways, if you think about um, these small communities, for example, that bid for constructing these mm -hmm. prisons, I don't know if you followed it, but there are some of them that are going bust, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they don't have enough uh, activity to actually fill them up. So it turns out to have been a false hope, a sham game. Um, the other option is, of course, just ramp up the immigration detention system and mm -hmm. push all those people in there. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying that the, the, the point I'm trying to get at is that model has not even worked on its own terms except for the very narrow group of people that are sort of sitting at, at the top of it. And part of, the, part of the challenge has to be to get people to see that, you know, the people who are... And, and you know, one of the things that's quite uh, interesting when you look at this is the ways in which the apparatus of the correctional system and the uh, sort of state policing have begun to sort of diversify, right, so that you have significant numbers of black and Latino correctional officers. You have black and Latino people on both sides, is mm -hmm. what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And now the question is, if we're talking about um, dismantling that system, as you say, what is it that's going to happen to people on both sides? But it cannot be the case that this is a sustainable model for either of those, mm -hmm. because um, ultimately there, there's no, uh, uh, that, that system was not in designed to sort of create a sustainable model. I would argue it was designed to strip the assets. And, and that's what we're seeing actually, sort of public asset stripping. Any other comments before we open it up to the audience? Okay, so I think the, the, the co-conveners will now be okay. I have left sufficient time. <laughs> <laughs> for the panel uh, to engage with you, the audience, and I think um, uh, uh, we'll have people uh, bringing the mics around. And so, uh, I'll start in the front. Sorry, I'm sorry, say, uh, uh, for those of us who don't know, please say your name and if you like your affiliation. Um, my name is James Williams, and I'm public defender for Orange and Chatham Counties, and I assure you, Daryl, that if we can shrink it, I won't be fighting it. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, for this wonderful discussion. What I want to touch on is the nexus that has been alluded to, and I don't think anybody disputes, between race, um, criminal justice, and control that has been has existed since mm -hmm. you know we've been on this mm -hmm. in this area, right, and still exists today. So um, given that, when you're talking about mass incarceration and abolishing or reform, I think you have to take into account the fact that there's a fairly significant racial gap in terms of how people view the criminal justice system, mm -hmm. whether it's fair or not, the sentencing um, project did a wonderful study on this not too long ago. So my question is, given that one of the predominant racial uh, uh, themes today is colorblindness, um, and, uh, and that a number of, uh, especially white people, aspire to that or endorse that, and a number of the policymakers, the gatekeepers, whether you're talking prosecutors, judges, police chiefs and officers, legislators are white. How do you 
talk productively about race and sort of moving this issue forward. Uh, because I think whether it is articulated verbally or not, hmm. I think it undercuts how people respond or not right. to the reforms or the abolishment that we want to see. So, you know, that's one of the, uh, the thickets of, of legislative advocacy, right? And um, because in legislative advocacy, you want to make the issues somehow relatable to the folks who make the laws, I mean, who, who have the, the ability to change the laws. And so I can give you just one quick example of, of what we did one year in Maryland, right? We were working on one of these bills. I forgot the, the, the bill. It might have been a, 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 um, a shielding bill to, to shield certain types of, of convictions. And, you know, this is just one little anecdote, but there was a white law student from Georgetown Law School who um, was convicted of drunk driving and killed, you know, his girlfriend you know, um, in this car. And, he testified in front, of, in front of the legislature because we wanted to tell the legislators, like, look, not, you know, it's not just you know, folks of color who have these issues with records or who, have, who are convicted of crimes. You wanna, so you want to diversify the folks who actually talk to your legislators. That's one issue. The other issue is, is Daryl's point, um, that you want to get the folks who are most directly impacted into the room to bring the context and those experiences to, to, um, to, um, to, to the legislators. And then also, I do think, we have to think about, when we think about you know, advocacy and, and, and reform, we really, I think, we need to do a better job of, of reaching out and thinking about um, victim rights groups, right? Because if you introduce a bill um, and a victim's rights group says, you know what, we're not, we're not fine with that bill. We don't like this bill. The legislators are going to listen to that group, right? And so I think we have to really broaden the tent um, and I'm just using that one anecdote in terms of legislative advocacy because that's what you know, I thought of when you, when you said that. But I think we have to really think about you know, really expanding the tent and really, like Daryl's point, about is who should be leading, leading these efforts. So well, I would one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, just quickly add that I think we're just going to have to be a little uncomfortable. Um, this is one reason why I've been so inspired by um, Black Lives Matter, all of the movement building around the country, and even well before that became a hashtag, young people who have um, been fearless and forceful in, in really calling out race and the ways in which, for instance, the school to prison pack school to prison pipeline has impacted their lives. Um, so I think we're, we're going to have to be a little bit uncomfortable and really direct, directly address race head on in these conversations. We can't hide from it, and we need to be explicit about it. Um, I was just going to say that, um, you know, you've put your finger on what has been, I think, the major sort of impediment to most interventions that we can think about. But I also wanted to note that we really are in sort of a very interesting moment when mm -hmm. the Koch brothers and Van Jones are sort of um, working together on a project of decriminalization, right? I mean, this sort of really does represent, um, I, I think, a kind of contestation to the post-racial myth, which is that uh, the criminal justice system is fair. Now, why would the Koch brothers uh, be aligned with this project, right? And what, ex what does it mean in terms of the model of reform that comes out of such a collaboration? I know this is this is a much bigger debate than we can do in these few minutes, but I guess I wanted to say that is to say that this is where you have uh, a sort of example of what Derek taught us about, which is interest convergence. Mm -hmm. And now we have to think about what are the sort of um, potential gains, losses, transitory um, kinds of, uh, this kind of transitory alliance can and cannot produce, what are the dangers, what can we see? And so I, I, I put all that on the table just to say that um, your point is well taken, but we're actually even, at a, um, to my way of thinking, in some ways an almost um, riskier point, mm -hmm. right? Because we're at the point where we can actually see that there are some interventions, as some of the ones that, that Mario named and others, are actually on the table. And what does that sort of pretend in terms of the long-term uh, project of sort of actually addressing questions of racial justice substantively and not just figuratively. So can we take two questions at a time so we can give the panelists more opportunity to... She's been standing back there. Okay, that's why I just wanted... Mm -hmm. If we could take two questions before we have the panelists respond. Thank you very much. Great panel. Uh, oh. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, great panel. Thank you very much. I'm Harold McDougall, Howard Law School. 
Um, I'm, I'm kind of tuned directly into the Daryl Atkinson channel. Um, it's a good channel. It's a very good channel. And, and there's a name, a person, one person's name who I haven't heard mentioned, which is Gerald Lopez. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole notion of rebellious lawyering really mm -hmm. talks about not just bringing in the folks who are most impacted as witnesses, but also harvesting and, and working with their problem-solving skills, the social capital. I think you really talked about that. Mm -hmm. um, as law professors, we also need to be thinking about rebellious, being rebellious also, that is connecting with the community. In fact, there's a piece in the Journal of Legal Education coming out right now, it's called The Rebellious Law Professor that examines that. Um, in terms of what uh, Professor Harris was saying about needing a radical economic renovation or change, re radically rethinking the economic model, I don't think that's going to happen until you radically rethink the political model. Um, and when you look at, and again, back, back to Daryl, when you look at Black Lives Matter, one of the things that's so striking about the Black Lives Matter movement, these are all young, edu very well-educated people, but they're very, very comfortable in the community. I mean, you know, you, you'll see them with folks who have barely any, edu any education at all, respecting you know, what they're doing, respecting uh, their insights, and bringing them to, to the table. So I think that you know, we really have, we're really just beginning uh, uh, with the kind of thing that Daryl is talking about. Hi, Anthony Farley, Albany Law School. Uh, so I'm going to speak as a former assistant U.S. attorney about this issue. I think there are two conversations that we're having, or two conversations we could have. One is about reform, and one is about abolition. And I think that the former conversation, which has dominated, is actually a lot less important than the latter conversation, the one about abolition. It's, we're not in a situation that we can reform ourselves out of, right? Where in India it's 30 people per 100,000 incarcerated or 50 per 100,000 in Sweden. In America, it's 700 per 100,000. And in the other America, the one behind bars, black America, right, for young black men, it is 10,000 people per 100,000, right? So 10,000 per 100,000, that's 10 times, greater than 10 times the number of black people incarcerated during, the apart during apartheid era South Africa. So we're not going to actually reform our way out of it because when we look to reform, our first principles are confused. We should abolish prison and replace it with nothing. And if that's a hard, if that's a hard concept to get your mind around, then you're in the other conversation about reform. And that conversation, I think, is opposed to the conversation about abolition. Right, so we're looking not, you know, you could do the Rosa Luxemburg reform or revolution, or you could think of it as reform, sorry, uh, abolition versus repetition. So to the extent you have abolitionist thoughts, I think we ought to get as closely in touch with those as possible, because I think the thing opposed to the abolitionist thoughts are reform thoughts, which I think are really thoughts about uh, repetition. So I think abolish the prison, replace it with nothing, if that's a sentence that fits neatly in your mind, then that's a conversation that we ought to, we ought to have. If it's not, I think you're talking about repetition. Can, can I try to marry the two? Um, <laughs> and, and because I think we can get caught up in a false dichotomy that they cannot, that reform cannot work in service of abolition. And I'm going to try to illustrate this point through a story. Forgive me. I'm a, I'm a country boy from Tuskegee, and, and we tell stories, and recovering trial lawyer, right? So we tell stories as well. So uh, back in my hustling days, I used to go to this bar and grill, me and my, me and my homies, called Cheeburger Cheeburger in Auburn, Alabama. And Cheeburger Cheeburger had this one-pound burger that we would smoke blunts and drink, and we would go down there, and we'd try to eat that burger, right? And if you could eat the burger successfully, your, your face would go into the wall of fame. <laughs> and we would go and try to eat the burger, and then we would fail miserably. And then one night, we saw this cat who ate the burger successfully because we, rep we uh, recognized him from his face on the wall. And we gave him the rock star treatment. We was like, man, you're the man. How did you eat that burger? Tell us your secret, you know? Because they would weigh the meat before they would put it on this big, huge bun with a mess of steak fries, and if you could eat it successfully, you'd go into the Wall of Fame. Man, how did you eat that burger? And he said something so simple but so profound, something that takes me from a cage 
in solitary confinement to say, shaking the Attorney General's hand to some, something that I helped build our program at the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. And I think it's instructive in the way that we can marry incrementalism and abolition. Man, how did you eat that burger? He said, one bite at a time. Mm -hmm. There is nothing that we can do. It's not one single policy. It's not one case. It's our oppression. The system wasn't built on one law or one amendment or one thing. It was built on a myriad of things, compiled cumulatively over time, right? And there was not one bite that I could have taken to eat that burger. I literally would have choked. So how can we have our incrementalism work in service of abolition? being very careful, to your point, to not get caught up in these dichotomies of violent versus nonviolent and create this super boogeyman that makes our work harder when we actually have to get to people who've committed harm, right? Because even if we let go of all of the people who've committed nonviolent crimes, that ticks the incarceration, we, we knock down the population by 8 to 10 percent. So we're going to have to deal with violence at some point. So getting into a rhetorical frame that creates people who've committed violent crime as a boogeyman is actually working in disservice of an abolitionist frame. So we need to be thinking about how can we incrementally take bites out of the big, huge burger that's mass criminalization, mm -hmm. second class status, structural racism, white supremacy, patriarchy, and capitalism. How can we take chunks out of that piece by piece? Because it wasn't built in one uh, period in time. It wasn't built in one administration. Not one law created it. And it's going to take time to get out of it as well, while at the same time developing our Cobb salad, right, that's going to take the place <laughs> of this coronary that I have on the table, right? So we got to be thinking of the alternative as well to really create the political will for people to people of goodwill. I'm a person of faith. I don't I'm not Hobbesian in nature. I don't believe man is evil and brutish. I believe that people of goodwill will get on this train. We have not painted an alternative narrative that they can buy into because people fear about their safety. Black folks, too. Right. You know, I want to get to this right. issue of victimhood. Right. We need to reshape. We need to dispel the lie that victimhood is Natalie Holloway, the right. biggest uh, consumers. Mm -hmm. of serious violent harm in this country are black and Latino men from the ages of 18 to 35. That's the victims in this country mm -hmm. if we really want to be accurate about it. Mm -hmm. So we just need to dispel these lies piece by piece, be griots and speak truth to power and tell the truth. But I don't think it's one thing that we can do to accomplish abolition. I think it has to happen piece by piece, but it can work in service of that larger goal. So if I could just weigh in very quickly, I mean, I, I completely co-sign everything you said. And I would um, say as well that abolitionism, of course, is never, ever really abolitionism, which is to say that you can think about slavery. Of course, it was abolished in one sense. It was reconstituted by another mean. So the it that we wish to abolish is always already reconstituting itself, which is precisely why the way that you suggest that we attack the problem uh, makes perfect sense to me. And to say that doesn't mean that it's an easy project. So every year when I teach critical race theory with my students, at the outset of the course, I say, you have a magic wand. Describe to me what your anti-racist world looks like. They are stumped. Uh, they, they, in other words, it's about uh, putting out fires and not necessarily articulating a positive vision. So I do think we need to have the positive vision around abolitionism, et cetera. But I don't think that means that um, incre incrementalism is necessarily out the door. And I think if critical race theory teaches us anything, it's precisely that one has to think about um, contestations inside and outside. And there is, after all, no existential perch from which we can sit that is outside the system. We're moving necessarily inside of it, even as we wish to bring it down. Let's take at least two more. Hi, um, my name is Anna Apostolaris. I'm a 3L here and one of the co-organizers of this conference. Thank you so much for coming, and this is a fantastic panel. Um, my question for you is, can you talk a little bit about the failure of police to train their forces not to fear black when men, women, and children? Because the concept of, oh, he feared for his life is a very subjective 
one. And we have so many studies that show that even if people aren't, don't think of themselves as racist and aren't overtly racist people, the associations with marginalized communities are very different than the, than the associations with those of white communities. So you have situations in which you're facing a white person doing the exact same thing as a black person, and you don't fear for your life with the white person, but you do fear for your life with the black person because of these implicit biases. Um, so I guess, can you talk a little bit about how to address that in policing? Hi, I'm also with Jameson University of Miami. And I, I, so I, I started with the, the Moynihan discussion about black family and what that means. Um, and Daryl was talking to us about alternative models for rehabilitation and support in communities. And um, Devin spoke to us about what segregation does in terms of police contact. And so I think a lot of experts have, do, and have said, well, the model then is to desegregate, to move, to break up black communities, to, to, to not have black people be isolated in these ways that create police contact and then a lack of support when um, they're trying to reenter the system. Um, but then I thought about Cheryl's thoughts about um, effective kin and familiar kin and the importance of these family units that we, I think, I think we rightly celebrate. And so I just wondered if the breakup of um, black families or black communities is a necessary cost in creating security across the board, um, or if we can envision alternative models that um, bring us safety and security and stability and decrease police contact, but don't break up um, black communities or black families or black spaces that I think we're, you know, we want to validate and, and affirm. On the um, point about segregation, part of what I didn't say is that segregation also, of course, communicates the idea that whites belong over here and blacks belong over there, and to the extent that blacks are over there, that too engender, gender, uh, engenders police contact. So I'm not sure then that the answer is um, uh, uh, sort of uh, somehow um, disaggregating black communities. I certainly wouldn't advocate um, for that. So I, I don't think that's a necessarily entailment um, uh, at all. With respect to the question about um, criminality, uh, the first thing I would say is that it's not all implicit. So I worry sometimes about the way in which the implicit bias literature gets picked up. And one way to think about the extent to which it's not all implicit is to separate um, stereotyping from attitudes. I think that dichotomy really helps. Why? Because it might be the case that you have implicit hate of a particular group. That doesn't mean that you, uh, your stereotypes are necessarily implicit. If I were to say, do you think Asian Americans are generally smart? Lots of people consciously think Asian Americans are. That's not an implicit idea. Uh, nor is the idea that African Americans are criminally inclined uh, just an implicit idea. It's a conscious idea. And I think implicit bias sometimes does too much work um, explaining what might be going on with police officers and others. Um, the final thing I will say on this is that um, Phil Goff, whose name has been mentioned, has done some terrific work uh, illustrating the extent to which what I would call police insecurity um, is not captured fully by explicit or implicit measures. So one concrete example of that is, to the extent that a particular police officer feels, for example, that uh, his, and it's a him, masculinity is being challenged in the context of a particular encounter, that ratchets up the likelihood that that officer will engage in violence. So Officer A is your complete anti-racist officer, but has a stereotype threat. Officer B is racist, but doesn't. Guess who fires first? It's your anti-racist guy, the guy who loves black. And I mean this quite seriously. In other words, it's a guy you would love to bring home as the progressive white guy. He gets everything right, except his masculinity is um, engenders a sense of vulnerable. That's the guy who quickly shoots. So in thinking about the problem of um, police violence, then these other variables has to be taken into account. And we have to be sure that when we're talking about implicit bias, that's what's on the table, as distinct from biases that are, quite frankly, concealed and are consciously held, which has entailments for how you might train. So just to add, because my, co my uh, colleague Song Richardson actually is working with Phil on some of these uh, precisely. studies um, and writing them up. But there are other studies that detail um, you know, things like shooter bias that are not all captured by unconscious bias and studies by people like Carell, um, uh, Everhart, 
um, and Greenwald each have done studies basically using police and computer models showing, you know, um, if you show them a, a black face and say, don't shoot unless there's a weapon and a white face, don't shoot, um, they often shoot blacks without weapons, right? Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. so I think one of the discussions is there needs to be their empirical studies and evidence, which I think capture the uh, greater range of complications with um, police bias and, and race and criminality. So others want to answer any of the, the, the two questions? Um, I, I guess I just wanted to speak to the question of whether or not reform toward abolition or uh, reform just generally pushes um, towards a kind of dissolution of black communities or in some way. So, you know, um, I've been rereading Du Bois. I, I just, you know, it's, it's what I do when I'm in trouble. Um, <laughs> and um, one of the things is, is um, that this is a debate that has also haunted us for quite some time. Mm -hmm. and, and the essay I've been reading is, Does the Negro Need Separate Schools? Mm -hmm. um, and part of the reason that I, I, I'm thinking about that in response to your question is that we are often inhabiting, once again, a dyad, a dichotomy between um, integration and segregation. Um, and as though that somehow um, our choices, our life choices, our, uh, uh, the ways in which we constitute communities have to be situated within these two polar extremes. And I think if we think about, if I think about the arc of my own life, um, it has been in both kinds of spaces, right? I mean, I have been in the context of segregated schools, segregated communities. I've been in the context of predominantly white. And I guess what I'm saying is that the arc of, I, I, I don't think that my experience is that radically different um, in terms of at least this conversation right here. Um, and so uh, the, the point I guess I'm trying to make is not to say that it's not an important question to attend to whether or not a particular move may or may not in fact, undermine the ability of a community to sustain and sort of project itself. But right now, what we really have are sort of colonized communities. Um, that is to say, they are not sort of self-determining in terms of their um, constituency, their political uh, life, their expression, uh, their economic life. None of that is, is what's actually going on. What we actually have is more of a kind of occupied territory, if you will, or whatever the metaphor you want to use. It is, it is a non-self-determining space. And so that, to me, is really uh, more of the key question. Um, and what that expresses itself in terms of black communities or communities of color may look differently over time, right? Uh, and, but part of it has to do with uh, recognizing that any particular um, any particular question actually goes back to the issue of political uh, power and and what is it is that is going to actually advance the ability of communities to become the kind of self sustaining uh, models and things that Daryl and and some of us uh, have been trying to talk about. Okay, so. Being uh, mindful of time, we are at the end of ours. Uh, can we once again thank the panel? Thank